Good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching Countdown on Bloomberg Quint Live, India's first digital live streaming business news service. I'm Navneet Saluja D'Souza. These are the top headlines that we're tracking at this hour. Markets continue to remain subdued. The Nifty trades in a very narrow range. Pharma and realty stocks are the top laggards. Yes, Bank is the top loser on Nifty after the Economic Times reported that one of the borrower radius developers defaulted on a 1200 crore loan. Auto stocks are also among the top losers on the Nifty right now after uh, the sales figure for the month of June came below estimates. And after a sharp surge yesterday, Godrej Properties is the top loser on Nifty and it is also the top loser in the Nifty Realty Index, which is down closer to 10% in trade. Good afternoon, Neeraj. Well, it's turning out to be a lackluster trading day, but I guess we are once again off the day's low. Now seeing some gains, index is inching closer to 11,900. Yeah, but we shouldn't be surprised as we were discussing all through the last few days, then run up to the budget, it'll be difficult to see big gains. And I guess that's the order of the day today as well, though no need to write that there's been a bit of a pullback from the lower levels in the session today will probably be in there around these levels um, I remember looking at the uh, distribution OI distribution is wedged between 11,800 and 12,000 so don't think there'll be a material difference from those levels for sure now mid cap uh, okay this is the OI distribution as you can see uh, about 11,800 on the put side and nearly 12,000 on the call side those still remain the highest levels for this expiry and therefore well, maybe that's what the traders seem to be betting on currently. Bring up the heat map very quickly and show you what's happening on the large caps. And then, of course, David, I'll speak up the mid caps uh, as well. But this is what the large cap universe is doing. Precious little, few stocks, three or four, which are doing well for themselves. Aishar continues um, to do well to the trading session. There is some strength in the PSU. So NGC up about 2.5%. IOC about a percent and a half. There is some strength in BPCL as well. And Z after the 8% uptick yesterday is up another percent and a half. HDFC continues on its merry way. So it widens the uh, gap between itself and HUL as the fourth largest company by market cap. So do watch out for that one too. On the flip side, Yes Bank corrects 6% in trade. There is weakness in Tata Motors and Sun Pharma and Bajaj Auto down about a percent as well. Tata Motors is a bit of a surprise because the numbers were weak, yes, but better than what the analyst was working with. However, 2.5% lower in trade and two-wheelers by and large seem to be under a bit of pressure. I know I can't spot TVS out here because it's not on the index, but Bajaj Auto and Hero Motor Corp are certainly lower in trade. What about the broader markets, Devina? Well, the broader markets are not doing any different. I mean, you have a few bright spots here and there, but uh, the undertone still remains uh, very subdued. There's nothing much that uh, comes out from uh, the nifty mid cap as well as the small cap index as well. In individual stocks then to start off with, uh, there are in focus. First off is Sadbhav Engineering and Sadbhav Infra. Uh, so Sadbhav Infra, the, the nine SPVs, they're exiting stake in all, the entire stake in all nine SPVs. Uh, Garnering close at about 6,600 odd crores from that. Sadbhav uh, Infra has come off. It was actually up about nine odd percent in the intraday trade and has come off and is trading absolutely flat right now. Cox King again yet another default first one was for 150 crores now another 50 crores so it's not really getting digested too well stocks down on lower circuit and Ikra uh, with uh, the the CEO and the MD being asked to step down immediately the stocks down about uh, four and a half percent other stocks on the move are the ADA group stocks they are having a decent enough day uh, in a market like this so uh, there has been some recovery in Reliance Home Finance about five and a half percent higher Reliance infrastructure that has been bearing the brunt of the brickworks downgrade today's session seems to be making a little bit of a comeback that stocks up about 4.7 percent and reliance power 2 is up about 4.7 percent top losers on the index we've already spoken about the Godrej properties as our headline stock in the real estate space that stocks down about 10 and a half odd percent a big move yesterday um, a, you know tremendous profit taking in today's session stocks at 980 after making an intraday high of 11.19 in yesterday's session Allahabad banks down six and a half percent and syndicate bank too really under pressure five percent under volume buzzers Ipka lab L Linda India and uh, jet Airways all of them doing decent enough volume is much higher than the last 20 days average and stocks that are trading near the 52 week highs SBI life insurance for one 52 week highs about 752 that stock is just a few points away 747 is where it's trading at Federal Bank is also near around its 52 week high I think it's 52 week high somewhere around this 109 mark itself and Trent is the other one 458 uh, very close to its 52 week high just up about one odd percent what's happening in the more liquid universe in the FNO space Navneet is joining it 
highlight that for us, Namni. Thanks for that, Davina. Well, the Nifty futures are at least trading above the mark of 11,900 right now. Uh, let's check what the premium currently stands at. It is just the same where we closed yesterday at about 37.38. And uh, but remember, there's no major build-up coming up when it comes to the open interest, and no fresh positions right now are being added when it comes to Nifty futures. Pull up the bank Nifty, which has been outperforming the Nifty in the last many sessions, and more action actually has been seen for the banking stocks. Bank Nifty is seeing cuts right now, but it's still trading above its 20-day moving average. Open interest up about 5%, telling you there are some positions being taken, at least in the intraday session. Let's check what the volatility index is doing, considering today Nifty is gyrated about 80 to 90 points uh, during the day. Underlying saw lows of about 11,814, but the VIX is on the lower side, so that's good news, at least for the bulls in the market. 14.4 is where India VIX is currently trading. What positions one should take, uh, take uh, for at least the Thursday expiry, that's the weekly expiry. Maximum open interest for this expiry is at the 12,000 call and the 11,800 put, which is giving you a very narrow range of about 200 points. Remember on the upside now, 11,900 remains key and not only just about breaching that mark, but also index comfortably trading above that mark of, uh, for about two to three sessions, which has not happened so far, at least in the Juna, uh, Ju uh, June series. Um, so as of now, you're seeing OI addition coming in for the 11,900, which is seen about closer to 6 lakh shares being added. But on the put side, writing continues for the 11,800, which we've defended in today's session. Remember, the low was 11,814. Almost 10 lakh shares have been added so far. So if you look at the um, premium that's been quoted on 11,800 put and the 11,900 call, that's giving you at least the near-term range in the index of about 11,785 on the lower side to about 11,950 on the upside. In terms of stock futures, Bal Krishna Industries is trading pretty much weak today. In fact, if you look at the counter, it's trading very close to its 52-week lows level. The futures have witnessed fresh shorting. There's a lot of uh, open interest buildup which has come in in today's session. And not only that, if you look at the cash side, the stock has fallen in very high volume. So in terms of OI, it's up about 32%. And the AVAT function of Bloomberg will tell you the projected volumes on the cash side. That's the white line. These are the, the average volumes that one has seen in the last 20 days, which is being projected on the blue line. The other one is Adani Power. Well, some momentum has come in for power stocks. We've seen even Torrent Power moving high in the last few sessions. So Adani Power was up 17% yesterday. Today as well, we've seen good amount of gains. The stock's trading at 52-week high. And fresh long positions have been seen there. The spot right now trades with gains of about 7%. And the top loser in Nifty today is Yes Bank. The counter is trading very close to the mark of 100. I was just looking at the options data. Maximum open interest as is at the 100 strike on the put side and on the call side it is at the 130 strike. So probably that's the near term range one can watch out but definitely on the downside now as the cash spot trades at 102 and the 100 put will remain in focus uh, as Yes Bank is now trading with cuts of about nearly 6 to 7% which is very close to its 52-week low mark as well. Okay, let's begin with the market voice. Shalinder Kumar, Director and CEO of Nernolia with us on the show. Uh, Shalinder, good having you. Thanks so much for joining in. You reckon the next two or three days, tactically, the markets could stay soft only? I mean, ahead of the budget, people would not be inclined to take large positions? Yeah, see, uh, market is very indecisive, I would say, and uh, the, all the technical parameter, if you look at, the kind of range that the technicals are, uh, you know, suggesting, it's a very narrow, like 11,800, 12,000 kind of a range, and I think that's okay. See, the, uh, the issue needed, I, uh, the way I'm looking at, Nifty is showing huge amount of resilience. So every economic news that you had in the last one month, uh, in terms of all kind of uh, macroeconomic data, you know, slowing down in consumption, auto sales, all the numbers, tax collection also, they all had been in, uh, indicating a kind of softness in the economy. But look at Nifty. It is where, uh, where it is right now. Is there for last one month. So nothing damage to the market. Is it a uh, absence of selling completely from the market? Or whether some kind of a positive micro trigger is expected out of budget, which can take the market on the new trajectory? Or post budget, the realization of this negative uh, macroeconomic news will hit the market and we'll have some kind of a uh, lower downtick is something to be watched out. Fundamentally, we are trading close to 19 and a half uh, price earning ratio. So 5-6% kind of upside and downside can always uh, happen. So one has to be, you know, quite nimble right now. Let the budget kind of event go before you take larger bet. For now, there is not much of a trading, you know, gains to be made in the near term.
Okay, so what you're saying is that uh, you're not going to want to make any new fresh big ticket investments and if you already have your portfolio allocations done, you stick to that and uh, hope for the event to pass through and then you start looking at other options. Right, yeah. So sir, in case you are holding it, see the thesis for the market for next two, three years is very strong. Look at all the themes which is playing right now also in the market. All your credit kind of a theme. So corporate lenders are doing pretty uh, well. Anyone who uh, met higher exposure to corporate lenders in the, in the beginning of this calendar year are sitting on 25%, 30% kind of a gain. Interest price playing out well. Rural value chain has not picked up, but I think there is good amount of uh, room for them to also to appreciate going forward. So I think thematically market is not uh, in a very bad situation, but optically all the macroeconomic number consumption side particularly is doing very bad. Whether that will be a you know, burden to the nifty for the remaining uh, month of this calendar year is something to be watched out for. Otherwise, pockets of economy is doing well and that, the, that is the pocket where you should hold on to the investment you have made. Because not only for six, seven months, for two, three years, the thesis remains very strong. You know, just looking at the year-to-date performance of uh, specific pockets, we've seen consumer discretionary taking a knock. Uh, but on the flip side, or rather on the positive side, energy stocks and IT as a pocket has not done badly. Can one probably extrapolate this trend for the rest of the year? See, uh, energy, I'm not very sure of whether the strain that we have seen in the last uh, four or five months will be extra, can, we can extrapolate for next six, seven months. The underlying uh, parameter which drives this sector is not very strong to my mind, whether in terms of volume growth for those goods or the margin level for the GRM or even the gas entity. So that side, I think, uh, is not very great. IT also, I would say, the kind of margin pressure we had seen among the larger names, I don't think the margin pressure is going out in FY20. Deal bid is very strong. Execution is slowly ramping up. The US economy is doing phenomenally well for these IT companies. So that the positive side on the top line number, margin remains in pressure. So IT will be, you can extrapolate that 10-12% kind of a gain uh, is possible in the remaining months of the fiscal year, I would say. But the areas which are doing good, so corporate lender, I would say, uh, on any correction, if something happens uh, on the budget day or afterwards, will be again a buying opportunity. Or the infra space, on the cement space, uh, those are the pockets where uh, tactically you should be more bullish on than the consumer discretionary. Because, you know, consumer discretionary, larger pie is auto numbers, and auto is not doing well, it's well documented right now. There is no sign uh, to my mind, even this uh, monthly number that we saw, I'm not seeing anything structurally positive. Uh, uh, before March of next year, we cannot be able to, you know, uh, fix a particular point of, you know, turn from where auto will start. Auto will start doing better. So I think consumer discretionary is still a void for my mind. Industrial, uh, cement, infra, and corporate lenders are the area where you can be, you know, betting more of your uh, portfolio position. Hmm. Shalindra, the other sector which is seeing some bit of attraction coming in the last few trading sessions from the likes of Adani Power or be Torrent Power. So the power producers are actually making a comeback. That could be on back of some fundamental news which has uh, come up for both these companies. But do you think going ahead, considering this sector has been a laggard, can it be a sunrise sector for the next two to three years now? Sure, I agree. You know, if somebody is taking a three to five year call, this sector will be a wealth creator, say 2021 onwards. Uh, right now, the Torrent Power case or the Dani Power recent one are very, you know, uh, individual stock specific news which have triggered a rally in those stocks. But as for the various, you know, micro estimates, the kind of power demand, uh, the growth in the power demand and supply, there will be a mismatch going forward, say 2021 onward. That will be creating a case for these stocks to give an in general rally in all the power stocks. Uh, but you have to look for, you know, um, not individual stock. Uh, as such, from there on, because uh, even the NTPC will go good amount of uh, legroom they, they have in terms of valuation relating. But I think uh, th there is a base building going on in power stock. It might remain for another year or something, and you can get a good amount of uh, positive return 2020 calendar end onward. The other one which has been a laggard at least for the last one year now is the auto pack, which has also been a victim of the liquidity crisis that one has seen in the system. What would you do with this? See, uh, NBFC crisis and then the auto number, uh, there is a general consumption slowdown as well. So look at consumer staples number also. The volume growth, growth for most of the names are, you know, coming out in a single digit, 6%, 7% kind of. So not only in auto, even the uh, FMCG side, the volume growth is very poor. 
Now, how the volume growth will turn positive uh, from here on is a question mark. I think right now uh, we got our cycle in auto deteriorated uh, since the July, June, July of 2018. Usually it takes 18 months to get the auto cycle back into the growth trajectory. So I think this calendar is off. There are a lot of cost push also in terms of regulatory changes which is happening in the auto sector. Come to end of this year or maybe Jan, Feb, March, where you will be able to see you know, how the pack pocket plays out. But uh, in the kind of competitive intensity which is there in the PV and the two-wheeler segment both, uh, the pricing pr uh, power will come even laggard. So the volume number will start improving from say early uh, next calendar year. But pricing power, uh, pricing kind of a gain will still wait for a couple of more quarters from there on also. So somebody looking for auto, I think better prices can still come in those stocks. So one can have one need to be a little patient and uh, go only for those co uh, company where the competitive pressure will be a little lower. So maybe in PV you can look for more not at current level, maybe at further decline or maybe Bajaj Auto in two-wheeler at some decline. All right, uh, we leave it at that. Thanks so very much for joining in, Charendra. Appreciate you taking out the time this afternoon. Uh, the other aspect, aside from what's been happening in the equity markets, is what's happening to crude oil prices. OPEC's dominant oil producer, Saudi Arabia, has agreed to do the heavy lifting for the fourth straight year as the cartel agreed to extend production cuts for another six to nine months in order to counter the U.S. shale gas boom. What does this mean for crude oil prices going ahead? Let's ask Sri Paravakarasu uh, of FGE, who's joining us right now on the show. Sri, thanks very much for taking out the time. Uh, so what's your initial reading of what goes on from here in terms of crude oil prices and whether you see them inching back towards the 76 77 dollar per barrel mark because you know there is going to be supply constraints and that's probably going to lend some support to crude oil prices. Uh, well, uh, we need to uh, understand first uh, the decision for OPEC to roll over the production cut is very much in line with market expectations. I mean, uh, uh, most of us, like analysts like us, and even uh, the players in the market quite expected this to uh, pan out in the OPEC plus meeting. Uh, so this is clearly not a surprise to the market. Uh, let's try to understand or do a little recap of uh, where fundamentals stand as of today and then try to you know uh, understand what this means to oil prices uh, for the future uh, there were lots of uh, events yeah, like both bearish and bullish uh, events which were trying to you know uh, uh, shift the balance of the oil market in the last uh, uh, two to three months and the key events being a uh, very bearish demand uh, outlook i know this was primarily centering around the us china trade war and then we had lots of geopolitical issues again uh, primarily i should highlight the tensions we had between us and iran um, and we also had big growth in us uh, tight oil production so lots of push and pull factors and if you need to evaluate them, uh, let's try to understand what happened in June. This is very important to you know, understand the future better. Uh, we, we did you know, crude prices shed by about like $10 between end May and say mid June, and primarily coming out you know, from the bearish demand indicators. There were lots of uh, weak macroeconomic data coming out of US, China, and all that kind of uh, pressured oil prices. Meanwhile, we also had U.S. production uh, growing a lot higher, and uh, this, this will continue. Uh, the, all these kind of mitigated uh, close to 2.5 million barrels per day of loss from Iran. So we really didn't see a big impact from that. Uh, and also, uh, like we had Venezuela going out, like Venezuelan production dropped by about like 400 kbd but none of that translated into like a big jump in oil prices given these bearish uh, fundamentals but yes um, when the tensions between us and iran intensified uh, in the the latter half of like june we did see four five dollar jump in crude prices but then it did not completely reverse the declines what we saw in the first half of june this clearly you know told the market or gave the signal that OPEC needs to roll over the production cut to sustain oil prices in this range. Any increase from OPEC could lead to a collapse in oil prices. So it was pretty much expected 
and uh, the decision is no surprise to us or even you know like uh, many of uh, the players who watch the market uh, closely it does offer some support uh, when we look at the fundamentals from now to say the 6 months or 9 months uh, clearly there will be an increase of about 3 to 4 dollars through the year end but uh, we we should really look for more downside risk um given uh, you know how bearish uh, the economy is the global economy is been uh, doing again uh, we can't uh, deny the fact the geopolitical tensions could uh, put a lot of upside so we will continue to see the volatility uh, uh, through you know end this sure. year depending on how sure. events pan out right yeah. shri just the other point being obviously while you have seen uh, saudi arabia and russia come to this agreement uh, in june itself we saw russia actually uh, you know uh, cutting down reducing oil production by more than what was agreed in the global deal do you see that repeating itself and how does iran play out in this entire scene uh, okay uh, yes in, in fact we we think saudi will probably um try to keep production at these levels uh, probably saudi arabia did all the heavy lifting right i mean um they probably uh, did more than you know uh, like 500 600 kbd than the agreement and probably they will have to continue to do so to keep the market in balance and um, some of the other countries will also comply uh, who failed to comply in the last round so it, it's pretty much clear otherwise with the us production you know like we have about 2 million barrels per day of non opec production and uh, um, this these con- the opec countries will have to comply uh, to the levels they did in the early half to keep the market in balance and for iran we think uh, uh, production will continue in, like or export should continue in that 300 400 kbd range um, through the rest of the year all right uh, that is with regards to what's happening to crude oil prices and the move there abouts she will leave it at that thank you so very much for joining us really appreciate you taking out the time that's the view coming in on crude oil prices remember we have seen that sharp correction like she pointed out from the end of may sometime during mid june and that probably uh, is uh, another reason that you need to monitor these oil marketing companies really closely because this time around they're not probably going to see those inventory gains coming about in uh, their quarter 1 results which happened to be so in quarter 4 of fi 19 where they had that huge inventory gain coming in there that propped up their overall uh, financial performance a lot alongside that obviously the elections kicking in causing a little bit of a drag on their numbers this time around and the overall demand picture itself looking slightly more weak at this time uh, for the oil marketing companies but moving on investec has come out with uh, trading ideas for the near term so amit sarkar is here to tell us about where investec sees potential growth and why they are betting on select stock summit Well, a bunch of stocks that they have mentioned in their report. I'll start off with the stocks which have the highest return potential. Top on the list is Tata Steel, which is expected to give a return potential of nearly four to six percent, and this is on the back of the improved deleveraging cycle, coupled with improved mining spreads, which are the positives for the stock. Says the brokerage. Second on the list is Aurobindo Pharma, where the return potential expected is nearly thirty-four percent, and that is on the back of the recent launches, expected India's approvals, and favorable valuations. Third on the list is Orient Electric, which is expected to give a return potential. of nearly 25% over the next 12 months and this is because the brokerage is expecting a sharp uptick in its sales of fans and air coolers on account of stronger and elongated summer in the first quarter of financial year 2020 icic prudential also is a stock where the brokerage is expecting a return potential of nearly 25% and that is because it is uh, ex- is expecting a surprise in its vnb margins which will be on the back of the continued increase in protection share and operating leverage in the savings business dixon tech where they expecting a return potential of nearly 18% and that is because on the back of a strong revenue growth and stable margins that is expected from the various segments of uh, Dixon uh, Technologies that is the LED TV lighting and washing machine segment and also along with this the capacity expansion that the company has planned will be helping the company as uh, revenue growth uh, stronger going forward now Canfin hopes that the brokerage is expecting a return potential of nearly 16% and that is because it believes that the company is well placed due to the strong liquidity and the solvency position of the company along with 
that its AUM growth, AUM is expected to grow at a 15% CAGR and the appointment of the new MD and CEO also augurs well for the company. Emphasis, the brokerage is expecting a return potential of nearly 15% and this on the back of the expected continuing strong growth. Also the high payouts that is the dividend plus the buyback that the company has announced will limit its downside and that's the reason the brokerage is bullish on the stock and has a buy rating and expecting a return potential of nearly 15%. On the sell side, uh, they have Lupin where, where they're expecting a, a downside of nearly 12% and that is because of weak commentary around the key products of the company along with that any uh, underperformance of this key products would also lead to many uh, uh, downgrades that the brokerage is expecting. Lastly, they also have a sell rating on Ramco Simmons where they're expecting a downside of nearly 15% and that is because they not believe, because they believe that the cement prices of the company are unstable, unsustainable and along with that the valuations of the companies are very rich compared to its peers. All right, Somit, thanks a lot for uh, bringing those top picks of Investec. But moving on, Macquarie has come out with a new note on the pharma sector that clearly sides with the generic drug makers. Well, the brokerage house doesn't see a sharp upside to the speciality play that some Indian companies have ventured into. Darshan Mehta is here with all the details. Darshan, over to you. Yeah, Namneet, so they've uh, upgraded a couple of companies, Dr. Eddie's and Glenmark are the two companies that they have upgraded. Uh, the companies which they like from uh, their tracking point of view include counters like Cipla, Dr. Eddy, Jubilant Life and Strides uh, and uh, Lupin stays an underperform item for them at this point of time. As far as uh, their uh, logic is concerned, what they're saying is that they believe that a slow ramp up and continued losses by specialty products commercialized in the US. Apart from it, they are saying they're circumspect about the specialty profit contributing to profit for most of the companies at least till FY21. And that is why they have lowered the EPS estimates on slower specialty traction with higher cost for most of the companies. What they're saying is pursuing the branded option is the right approach given the fact that there has been a slowdown on the generic side of the business. But the concern that they have is on the expectation of the street that they have from the upside potential from the specialty products. What they're saying is that Indian companies will now have to compete with big pharma companies, mostly for the specialty drugs, which was not the case as far as generics was concerned. So he finds that uh, the going will probably get even tougher for Indian pharma companies, at least in the branded and specialty business. All right, Darshan, thanks a lot for bringing all those details. Since we are on the topic of pharma, I just want to pull up Newland Laboratories. I think that counter has seen some buying momentum in the last 10 to 15 minutes of trade. The stock currently trades with gains of about nearly 14% at about levels of 610. Okay, moving on. The Island FS default increased borrowing cost for most non-bank lenders, but companies with strong parentage like m and Financial Services has already recovered from that. In a conversation with Bloomberg Quinn's Advert Rao. Ramesh Ayer assures that Mahindra Finance um, no longer faces any difficulty in raising funds. Listen in. When we closed March, we had one of the best years. Uh, so I think it's important to understand that, uh, you know, whenever these kind of uh, events happen at the marketplace, yes, do the players do get impacted, but not all of them and not permanently. So yes, between October and January, we did find the cost of funds go up. It went up as high as maybe 70, 80 basis points. Subsequently, it has got corrected maybe even by 40, 50 basis points. And therefore, I think the present uncovered increase would be maybe 25, 30 basis points. In as far as availability of funds are concerned, I think if we were willing to pay a price, the availability was adequate. So we never suffered from non-availability as an issue. Yes, October was a little more difficult to be able to convince everyone to say that you know, the model is more stable, etc. But then once that was well understood, we didn't have to really worry about ability to raise money. Even as we speak now, is non-availability of funds an issue for a large NBFC like ours? I would not say the answer is yes. But I think one needs to have a little more stability to be able to plan for long term and that's the only discussion. Sir, you recently there was a media report saying that you're looking at overseas bonds, uh, tapping overseas bond markets. They said 460 million is what you're looking at, dollars is what you're looking at. Um, I, I, is it a reggae bond? Is it a masala bond? What are you sort of... No, see, at this stage, you know, the instrument is still not decided. We are in the process of rating ourselves. But clearly, we would be guided by the availability and the rate at which it's available. 
right so one of course we look at it as a a new additional liquidity support but more than that we would be conscious also of the rate at which it's available so whatever can kind of get us money which is almost equal to the current borrowing cost all cost included including covers etc i uh, will then decide the instrument but you're right it would be any one of those instrument or mix of them there are uh, several concerns about the auto sector that you know consumption has come down so therefore auto sales are going to come down even further than what the numbers were reported uh, in the past few weeks are you as a financier to the segment uh, what are your concerns or do you think it might be overshot uh, in terms of the criticism i think at least my past experience i'm talking more about rural per se is whenever the elections are announced and that year you will always see some advance buying happen right and i would somehow think that uh, the last year's added capacity is nothing but something got advanced from what people otherwise would have bought now second is rural is normally driven by the uh, monsoon sentiments and there was some talk about delayed monsoon etc now that it's kind of arrived maybe a little late but i think the sentiments would start driving positive again So the third cash flow with which the rural drives clearly is the infra cash flow which we expect that during this budget there would be a lot of talk about what are the infra story that's going to open up if all three is true right i would somewhere expect that from post the festival season from the october november times you will start seeing the sentiments pick up positive but currently you're right the volumes are under pressure and therefore to that extent everyone will have a little low business but that would get covered the second half Uh, so last question in terms of the sme lending business um, what is the portfolio size grown to and are you seeing concerns that you know because other lenders also are some other nbfcs have stopped lending or cannot lend because their access to funds is being short tailed that there could be rise in defaults in the sme loan segment whether it's mudra loans or um, or regular loans so if you look at our overall book i think sme will be around 7% or so so we're not a very large player in that sense but also important to look at you know what you categorize as sme so for as we concerned our sme portfolio is largely into the agri auto engineering kind of a segment where we have a lot of ecosystem play with the oems we did have some exposure to refinancing the smaller nbfcs etc which we had curtailed the last 6 months from the time the pressure of liquidity started mounting so that portfolio has actually run off for us but pure sme lending on uh, you know capex etc and we are not into so much working capital support but all this asset lending which we have done to auto engineering and uh, uh, the farm segment i think is a decent growth it's not a very aggressive growth and uh, that's not our major concern because those are directly related to the schedules as expansion program given by the oems so last question um, essentially the alm asset liability mismanagement happened mainly at the housing finance companies you have one housing finance company rural home finance under your uh, ambit uh, what is the situation there and in terms of because that that company mainly targets the affordable mid income segment in rural india how are you seeing sales um, and repayments happening in the real estate sector so clearly like to define for you the business that we are in we are actually into real rural segment where the large book is only that and it is nothing but room addition room expansion loan and the ticket size is as small as 100000 so it's a 1 lakh rupee loan so we don't run any mismatch in that but surely the recoveries are directly linked to the earnings of the local population so in maharashtra we have a little increased overdue situation because of the you know during the demonetization time the cooperative bank participation was low and many of your consumers bank from cooperative bank so they couldn't get loans for crop fertilizer which normally they take so they have used their self surplus so to that extent there's been some delay that we have seen but that's getting correct beyond then that i don't think we have a problem with any mismatch or a major recovery issues well that's uh, ramesh ayer on the space at large not just on mnm financial and enough has been more enough and more has been spoken about that pocket but there's always scope for more however let's move focus the last half and last uh, 56 minutes of trade left let's get in our technical experts on board to try and talk about what to do in a scenario like this in the run up to the budget Uh, Sachit Anand Uttekar of Trade Bulls with us with his thoughts on the charts in a moment. Himin Himin will also be with us uh, uh, to speak about his thoughts. Sachit Anand, let's start off with you first. Um, how are you approaching trade the next two or three days? If you had to take a position, would it be on the long side? Would it be on the short side, or you would refrain from taking any index positions? Good afternoon, Neeraj. Uh, in fact, uh, you know the trend under trajectory clearly stays on the long side. In fact, uh, if you look at 
the way we you know uh, uh, the, the entire structure which, which was built from the support level of around 11650 the way we rebounded and uh, you know in, even in today's session the recovery from the 11800 support zone has been phenomenal so probably you know we may see an extension of this particular move uh, towards 12100 and uh, if you look at the overall structure, the structure, the bullish structure will only be violated in case if we have a closing above below 11,770 from here on. So clearly, you know, the bias on the market remains positive, and I think uh, you know we uh, uh, the the moment we have a closing above 11,910 in today's session, probably the the base might shift from 11,650 to 11,800. So it's a clear cut, uh, you know, upward uh, upward uh, uh, trend. And one has to uh, maintain, uh, you know, a trading stop strategy in case if uh, fresh longs are, are to be built in. The stop loss for the trade would be around 11,770 on the closing basis, and we have a uh, target uh, in mind somewhere close to 12,100. Okay, uh, let's also bring in uh, Hamin Kapari of KR Choksi, who's joining us right now on the show, along with him, Avinash Gurak Shekhar of Joint Ray Capital. They're here with us in the studios. Gentlemen, uh, good afternoon to the both of you. Uh, since we were on the technicals uh, with Sachitan and Hemin, I'll uh, quickly start off with you uh, on your call on the index right now. Today's session, uh, slightly more muted. The start was not really great, but we're up a quarter of a percent, so not bad going. Well, very good afternoon to you, Devin. I think flooded Mumbai had to mean uh, subpar volumes, but uh, yeah, we've uh, on the cusp of the budget, so pre-budget rally or not, downside appears limited, Devina. So I have a plain simple sell of the 11,500 put. I don't think till Friday evening that uh, we're going to tank unless there's some harakiri in the budget. So, And we've not had a, you know, normally, normally we have a pre-budget rally. We've been elevated, but we still haven't had that pre-budget rally. So one downside appears capped and two, we seem set to make another attempt at 12,100. 12, so just sell the 11,500 put option. Okay, sell the 11,500 put option. So going uh, positive by using options. Uh, let's also take a look at what individual stock ideas both our technical experts have. Hamian, why don't we start off with you? Yeah, firstly, I, it's it's moved a bit, but uh, I have a buy on Tata Elixir. Uh, it's uh, done well, and uh, I think we've seen weekly positives. So buy at 920, stop loss 914, target 932. And the second <coughs> one is a buy on Biocon Devina. We've not yet given the breakout, but we've spent almost uh, 12 trading sessions in a consolidation phase between 845 and, oh, sorry, 245 and 254. A buy at 250, stop loss 245, there's a target of 260, which should get easily overshot once we overcome this uh, resistance level. Mm. Biocon has actually not been doing all that badly. In fact, one of the uh, slightly better stocks within the pharma space, if you have to compare it to the other mid-tier pharma stocks that have really not done well on a YTD basis. Uh, Sachit Anand, what about your stock ideas? Well, we have so, three trading ideas. Uh, all are on the long side. Uh, the first one is uh, buy call on Reliance Industries. Uh, so if you look at the uh, you know, June series, we saw uh, the stock you know, oscillating lower uh, within a wedge kind of a formation. From the levels of around 13.40, we never saw a reversal in this particular counter. Now at this uh, particular juncture around 12, uh, 12.40, 12.60, you know, we, we have seen a bullish Rami right at the pattern support and we believe that this particular uh, uh, pattern, uh, you know, marks as the end of the, uh, you know, bearish structure which was uh, running uh, throughout the June series. So we are expecting that uh, there could be a reversal in place and that's why we are recommending uh, buying Reliance here. The stop loss for the trade should be placed at around 12.60. From a trading perspective, uh, we are expecting a move uh, towards 1340. The second call uh, is also a buy call on Century Textiles. Uh, we have already seen some strong OI additions in today's session. We have on the daily scale, uh, we are seeing a rising three kind of formation. On the weekly scale, we have already seen a hammer formation followed by a spinning top. So overall structure looks really good. Uh, the stock has uh, still not seen momentum. We are expecting that uh, you know 985 uh, could be seen in this particular week. The stop loss for the trade should be placed at 947. The third call uh, is a buy call on uh, PNB. Uh, if you look at the overall structure, uh, we have already seen a double bottom kind of formation near to 75 levels. We recently we saw a conversion of the uh, short term averages, which are which is indicating uh, you know fresh momentum to be witnessed. So with that perspective, we are expecting a move towards 85 from a trading uh, on a trading basis. Uh, 
the stop loss for the trade should be placed at 78.50. Positionally, we are expecting that uh, this move uh, can ex extend right up to 88. So, you know, uh, even short term traders and investors both can look at uh, PNB uh, you know, uh, from this level. Okay, so those are some technical ideas coming from our experts. Let's also get some fundamental view going ahead for the markets. Uh, Avinash, I'm just looking at the power companies, and it's after a while all these companies are trading at 52-week high levels. The Dani Power, you've got Torrent Power trading at 52-week high, and even Tata Power has surged right now. It's trading uh, with gains of nearly 3%. Uh, uh, Adani and Torrent have moved on back of some news development. Specifically for Adani, I guess, Supreme Court has ruled that uh, the company can go ahead and take permission from CEI in order to track uh, uh, increase tariff for previous years as well. What have you made of this development and what's the outlook going ahead for the power space? Uh, my guess is I think you know it's a good move that uh, you know uh, previous years also uh, the companies could possibly uh, get some tariffs uh, you know hiked but typically if you see the cost structure and uh, especially you know companies which uh, import uh, uh, you know coal I think that has been a pain point in the past and most of these companies uh, Navneet have not actually delivered on the earnings uh, growth at all. So I would believe that you know from a near term perspective some momentum could come in you know from the budget standpoint some policy initiatives could be announced. But from a longer term perspective you know investors have not really made money here. I don't think uh, anybody has made a lot of money uh, you know and some sort of a wealth opportunity in these companies. I would uh, prefer most of the distribution companies you know something like a Kalpatru Power or maybe even a KEC International which have a strong order book a, a decent kind of execution track record and you know are available at uh, sub 10 kind of valuation multiples one year forward. So I would believe that you know these could be better opportunities uh, considering the fact that distribution is also going to be a key uh, you know variable on the power generation kind of side. Okay, um, that's the view on the power space. And uh, what about the autos? The monthly sales numbers have once again disappointed, and for majority of them, for example, TVS, which has been hitting fresh 52-week lows, uh, would you recommend nibbling now at these lower valuations? TVS, of course, is still compared to the other two wheelers. The valuations are expensive. Any stock that you would venture out at lower levels now? No, I think uh, you know if one were to look at the two-wheeler space, I think uh, Bajaj Auto, uh, you know, delivered a decent set of numbers, so uh, they were much better than TVS. And I think if you look at the valuations of uh, Hero Motor Corp, you know, most of the froth has actually gone out, and I think it's trading at roughly about 13, 14 times one-year forward numbers. So I would believe that you know somebody who wants to uh, make a contra call, this could be a good entry point, provided uh, one is willing to you know wait for maybe one or two quarters of underperformance. I think uh, a good monsoon, hopefully. Uh, if it uh, you know materializes into a reasonably good uh, demand from the rural uh, markets could possibly help uh, hero motor corp and our sense is that you know in the coming budget now need there could be some positive surprise for these two wheeler companies uh, possibly taxation rates you know which are around 28% could possibly see a good reduction and uh, i think that could possibly propel you know demand going forward but at least in the near term at least for the next uh, 3 to 6 months uh, this kind of underperformance will continue i don't think you're going to see any uh, immediate uh, upside in these but companies. the budget will not tinker with the gst rates yeah budget in the budget, we may not see any sort of rationalization coming for GST rates. No, GST may not come, but uh, typically, you know, I would believe that uh, my sense is, I mean, some sort of, uh, you know, concession measures because okay. obviously uh, two wheelers are considered to be a mass, uh, you know, transportation product. And uh, uh, sense is that uh, typically, you know, I think uh, the first recovery could possibly be seen in two wheelers. Uh, four wheelers still, I would believe the liquidity from the NBFCs has been pretty bad. So that is definitely going to take a lot of time. And I think you, we won't be surprised that the first quarter uh, financial numbers which are going to come out post the budget are going to be extremely bad. So I think the markets are obviously factoring in, you know, all these concerns at least in the near term. Well, let's take a look at what else um, has uh, not done well today. Amongst others is Yes Bank, down about 7%, trading at the lowest point of the day. Uh, we don't have any confirmations as yet from Radius, but the news stories around Radius developers and whether they have exposure, whether they don't have exposure, what's the extent of the exposure, all of that still up in the air. For 121 million shares traded today, Yes Bank has fallen about 7%. On the charts, I mean, Yes Bank, uh, does it It's come at these levels and bounce back once? Uh, is it a bit of a strong support or do you reckon that it can break this and go lower? Well, like you said, we've come to 98.70 and bounce back on 20th June. So uh, strong support, I am not that sure because I believe this is a multi-year low and 
I am once again not very sure whether this support has worked in the past. Yeah, it, yeah, it pro probably has somewhere in 2014. So yeah, it seems like a decent support. Logic says that it, it should take uh, support and bounce back. We've seen a lot of volumes happening. Uh, the breakdown hasn't happened, but um, rather than second guess it, I'd wait for see wait to see if this actually works. And we'd get a late confirmation, obviously, when uh, uh, Yes Bank closes above 115 on the daily chart. But yes, if I were to anticipate, I think it's overdone, and this time the support should work. Okay. Yeah. There are some divergent moves today, by the way, in the India Bulls Group versus the Yes Bank stock. So Yes yeah. Bank has corrected today. The last 45 minutes, if you see the India Bulls Group stocks, India Bulls Housing, India Bulls Ventures, all of them have gained. Look at that surge in India Bulls Housing in the last half an hour or 40 minutes. India Bulls Ventures was in the red, is back in the green as well, 1.82. So these stocks are actually doing well for themselves. Sachidanan, India Bulls Housing, which is the more traded one, but India Bulls Ventures, uh, no mug either on the volumes front. Uh, either of these two stocks? I think both both are uh, showing uh, you know similar moves. In fact, uh, you know if you look at India Bulls Housing Finance, since last two uh, trading sessions, you know it has uh, you know definitely defended uh, the support zone somewhere close to around 620. So probably any particular weakness in this particular counter from here on will only unfold uh, if the stock slips below 620 from here on. On the higher side, I think uh, this particular bounce back may extend right up to say 675, 678 uh, kind of a zone. So probably in case if someone is long or you know, probably if someone is uh, you know looking for an exit, then I think uh, that could be one particular level that he has to wait in. Uh, in case uh, you know uh, from a shorting perspective, I think uh, the weakness will only unfold in case uh, the stock slips below 620 from here on. Okay, and uh, you know, in a conversation with Mr. Gagan Banga, uh, you know, a few days back, and specific to its deals with Yes Bank, he categorically said that you know, it's it's a non-issue. It's a very very small uh, uh, exposure, so it's really not a, re a big thing to go by, at yeah. least from an India Bulls. Uh, Housing perspective. Finance. Housing no finance. exposure to Lodha as well. I yeah. think he yeah, no, no stated. exposure to Lodha. And as Supreme well. and a couple of other uh, exposures. I think he said that the standard assets which are starting to Super pay tech. back. Super tech. Yeah, not Supreme. Excuse me. Super tech. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. So that's uh, India Bulls uh, housing and Yes Bank. The other one uh, that we're uh, focusing on is Godrej Properties. Two straight days, big moves, but you know, divergent. Uh, to say the least. Yesterday saw a big jump of 11%. Today it's uh, uh, the mirror image of that. 11% down, 974 on a Godrej Properties. Sachidanan, would you sell Godrej Properties at 974? Well, uh, when we look at uh, you know uh, such a volatile move, you know uh, yesterday we saw a breakout somewhere close to thousand levels and uh, the move unfolded accordingly. But uh, if you look at today's session, you know that same level has uh, uh, you know uh, the stock has slipped below that particular level. So probably you know there could be a reversal in place. So in case if we don't see a recovery in this particular counter about thousand, I think you know it will be better if uh, to book profits from this particular counter. This could be a you know a, a breakout failure kind of a candidate. So overall, I. I think uh, you know, the structure will start looking weak uh, if the stock slips below 940. So it's better that you know, uh, in case if there's a relief rally and if the stock does not sustain about 1005, then it, uh, it's better to book your profits and move out. Okay. Another pocket, and Avinash, I want to come to you on this one. Is this is a sugar space, and now it looks like uh, Southern Bay's sugar millers are facing another issue, which is the scarcity of cane itself. You've got EID Parry that has shut down one of its factories near Puducherry. Uh, you've got Tiru Arun Sugar's severe uh, uh, slash in production due to non-availability of sh uh, sugar cane, and then uh, you've got Shakti Sugar's, which has been another major producer, has been going through losses in the past. So, I mean, it seems like. Uh, all of these players seem to be going through severe shortages in terms of sugarcane. That could be another big variable. Uh, I think, Devina, this seems to be a more of a localized, uh, mm. you know, kind of problem. I don't think uh, this is a problem which is going to be, uh, which is seen by the other larger players like a Balrampur or a Dhampur uh, sugar. And I think clearly the story in sugar companies is uh, more to do with the byproduct that is ethanol. I would believe that, you know, the kind of quarterly numbers we could see in the coming uh, quarter, especially the June and September quarter, could possibly see a good ramp up in the ethanol business. On the sugar business, I would believe that, uh, you know, most of these companies
company managements have been saying that uh, whatever uh, revenue and profits do come in is now going to be uh, additional uh, revenue driver i think uh, rather than looking at it as a core business so i think for sugar companies in the south it could be a little bit of a pain considering that uh, you know if sugar cane uh, is not going to be available and you know these companies which you mentioned devina are basically not integrated players you know most of them are stand alone sugar units mm. so probably uh, they won't be benefited by the ethanol you know revenue driver and which i think is the key uh, element now if you look at sugar companies so i think it's better to stick to integrated players i think a balrampur or a dhampur even uh, despite the kind of uh, volatility in the markets i think you know earnings from this business are going to be pretty solid in the coming 12 to 18 months okay um that's the view coming in on the sugar space but moving on to the chart of the day even the bullet has to slow down at some point and that's exactly what's happened with royal enfield which has bucked the trend for so long sales have been slowing down for a few months now and the pains just increased in the month of june yashopa there's here to tell us more on that yash over to you afternoon navneet so uh, royal enfield reported its worst ever monthly sales number in at least 6 years according to data available on the company's website now uh, the total sales for the month of june were 22% lower which is also the eighth consecutive month that the company has reported negative uh, sales growth uh, over the last 10 uh, year period in fact the last 12 month period uh, in terms of absolute number the company sold 58300 uh, motorcycles in the month of june uh, which is only the second time in the last 28 months that the company has managed to sell less than 60000 motorcycles in a month with the exception of uh, of the month of december uh, wherein because of work and unrest at its oragodam facility uh, in chennai uh, the production uh, there was a production shortfall of close to 15000 units and now uh, which has the main re- what is the main reason behind this drop uh, well the company sold 17000 fewer motorcycles in its mass selling less than 350 cc capacity uh, models which is uh, their bread and butter as it accounts for nearly 90% of its overall sales uh, in terms of the sales for the company in that period uh, that translates into a 25% drop on a year on year basis now the main reason for this according to uh, senior analyst auto analyst at lkp securities ashwin patel uh, is the dip in the product cycle for the company along with the lack of easy availability of financing on account of the nbfc crisis and overall stiff competition in the industry uh, both from the domestic players like bajaj auto and international players uh, like uh, Benelli as well as Triumph Motors. On the other hand, the company uh, saw a 17% growth in sales of its models having a capacity engine capacity of more than 350 cc. Now we spoke to a dealer to try and understand uh, this anomaly and he tells us that uh, typically these are the premium bikes having an average ticket size of 2 and a half lakhs to 3 lakh rupees. Uh, the customers that buy these sort of bikes, uh, they are they generally belong uh, you they they they're generally uh, you know uh, auto enthusiasts and uh, well affluent as far as their economic background is concerned so financing is not a huge issue for them exports too gave in some comfort as they rose 72% on a year on year basis to almost 3250 units but overall the picture remains very poor the sales were down 22% which is the biggest drop and an eight consecutive month of negative sales growth uh, royal and feel clearly uh, uh, on a rough road okay yash thanks a lot for bringing that chart of the day for us avinash any thoughts on aisha i think uh, i've need clearly i think uh, you know a product which used to enjoy a long waiting list uh, once you get a sense uh, as to how uh, you know painful has been the period in the last 6 to 8 months Uh, i would believe that you know i think maybe the first and the second quarter for aisher motors is going to be extremely painful uh, the re business has been very profitable and unfortunately if the volumes don't pick up uh, you could see a very strong compression in the ebitda margins and i think uh, the stock has actually uh, you know been showing those kind of signs i would not be surprised that post the june quarter numbers we could see some sort of a further fall in the price and i think uh, uh, the management commentary has been pretty weak i think in this kind of a scenario uh, it would be better that you know i think in Investors should at least stay away for at least some time before we see some recovery sign again. You know, one point is, of course, the entire space is not doing well, but I think they've also lost the market share in key uh, states this time around. I think uh, Bajaj has tied up with Triumph. I think uh, you got players like Harley Davidson. So I think uh, you know, P- 
people, most of the customers also want a more wider choice and I think that is why uh, possibly the product has seen some sort of a fatigue. But I think clearly in terms of product development and in terms of, uh, you know, the volume growth, uh, the real kicker for the stock uh, would obviously come in when, you know, the uh, volume growth actually starts moving in positive territory. And I think it's going to be a, uh, going to be some more time because clearly here also, you know, despite the fact that affluent customers used to spend a lot of uh, money for these bikes, I think funding and financing, you know, has also reduced considerably. So I think it's better to wait. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised that at least, you know, till September you could see a dry quarter for Aisha Motors. Hmm. The other one is uh, Edelweiss. Triple that stock up now. I think it's uh, in a just about uh, uh, under its uh, 50 and its 100 day moving average uh, right now. And you know, the base or rather the levels from where it's previously bounced back is somewhere closer to about 140. Not there yet, but it's definitely off those highs of about 200 that it recently witnessed a few weeks back. Hey man, Edelweiss at 168? 11 months between 126, uh, 129 and 206. Uh, no directional bias, Devina. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to go down much, but we need a close up of 206 if it has to do something out of the ordinary. So it doesn't look bad, but uh, I think the malaise on, in the mid caps continues, so it's been slightly better. But last 18 months, despite technical positives time and again, I don't think they just respond. So. 11 and a half months, I'd wait for a move on either side or if if it comes closer to 129, I can take a contra buy over there so the risk reward ratio could be in favor. Mm. All right. Recently become uh, sort of a pretty well gauged trading play on Eagle guys at 168. The volumes are uh, decent. I wouldn't say they're really high, but they're decent enough. We're going to take a very short break on that note to hear out Alliance's Mamad El Arain, who spoke to Bloomberg earlier today and listed three key factors that he is tracking in the U.S. economy amidst concern of global slowdown. Listen in. The big data really is coming uh, this coming Friday. We need the household to continue to be robust. That is key for the U.S. continuing to outperform the rest of the world. So I, I will look at that number a lot more than I will look at the other numbers up to Friday. So what are you looking for on Friday, Mohammed? I'll tell you what I'm hoping for. Um, I'm hoping that you're going to get the trifecta of job creation above 150,000 after last last month's disappointing number, that you, you see wage growth staying above 3%, and that you see the labor participation rate going up. That's what I hope you're going to get. I suspect you'll get two out of three, but I was ho I'm always hoping for that third one, which is labor participation. 200K was what we managed to do pretty much every single month for a long, long period of time, Mohammed, and many, many economists kept saying, this isn't sustainable, and then it was. So we had that point where we are expecting to see a little bit more volatility in the pay Rose number in a way that maybe we hadn't in the previous few years. Yeah, we should because there's a limit to how many more jobs you can create. Um, we should be seeing an average of 120. We've seen an average, multi-month average, much nearer to 200,000. But I think, John, the one thing that economists are going back and trying to figure out is do we have such deep structural changes in the economy that we can run this economy at high growth and low and stable inflation? And that's critical for the Fed call as well. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of understanding the new structure of the economy. Well, let's get to the Fed rate cut call. The market's looking for four cuts over the next 12 months. The Federal Reserve, Chairman Powell exclusively, communicating this idea that an ounce of protection is worth a pound of cure. That doesn't sound like a man that's about to cut rates by 100 basis points, Mohammed. Where do you see this playing out? Yeah, I'm baffled by this notion that an insurance cut is 100 basis points. An insurance cut is not 100 basis points for two reasons. One is you don't want to use up all your ammunition now. And secondly, if you really need to cut by 100 basis points, it's well beyond insurance. There's something deeply wrong with your economy. So the marketplace, I think, has gotten too far. But John, that is the history of the market. The Fed gives a little, and the market pushes it even more. And I think the market is getting a little bit greedy in terms of, Fed, of, of rate cuts. I, I would look more 25 to 50 over the next 12 months, not 100. an idea.